On October 3rd, he asked me what day it was. It's October 3rd. Hi, I'm Professor McCoy. And today I would like to talk about a movie that is an amazing, surprisingly, platonic allegory. Of all things, I want to talk about Mean Girls. Now, Mean Girls is probably not anywhere near the first movie that you might think of, either when you're thinking of platonic allegories or when you're thinking of a, a philosophy professor, particularly a male one, uh, talking about these sorts of things on the internet. Uh, and funny enough, that's the same thing that my students said. In fact, this entire idea comes from when I was teaching a course on Plato, uh, a link to which you will find in the description. I had a student uh, chastise me for using analogies that were far too... Uh, perhaps esoteric, perhaps nerdy, perhaps too male. Uh, and so I, uh, upon my next rewatch of uh, the film Mean Girls, I found that there were a surprising number of parallels to the various points that Plato makes throughout his book, The Republic. And so I've picked this up and I've actually started to use this as an example from time to time. And I thought that I would share this in its totality in a nice condensed form with you all. So. What are these parallels between Plato's Republic and Mean Girls, of all things? Well, one might think uh, of Plato's allegories and jump straight to things like the cave. In fact, I've got a couple of videos there right on the subject uh, in the description as well. However, that isn't the only analogy throughout the Republic. The more pervasive analogy, as I've also outlined, is the entire political discourse throughout the middle books. This is a view uh, promoted by uh, a lot of Plato scholars, most notably by CDC Reeve, that the entire political text within the Republic is primarily an allegory for the soul and looking at how the well-ordered soul is structured versus how the poorly ordered soul is structured. In other words, it's an ethics text more than it is a political text. In fact, it may not even be a political text at all, except by rough analogy. And so this is the allegory, I think, that Mean Girls does an excellent job of typifying. That is, the various sorts of people of well-ordered versus less well-ordered versus completely inverted models of the soul. Virtuous people and vicious people and the transition between them. And so if we look at the group of the plastics, the, uh, the main major and protagonistic, also antagonistic, hero, villain, the major group of girls in Mean Girls, the Mean Girls, if you will. You've got Katie, you've got Regina, uh, you've got Gretchen, and you've got Karen. That one there, that's Karen Smith. She is one of the dumbest girls you will ever meet. That little one, that's Gretchen Wieners. She's totally rich because her dad invented toaster strudel. Gretchen Wieners knows everybody's business. She knows everything about everyone. And evil takes a human form in Regina George. She's the queen bee, the star. Those other two are just her little workers. Regina George. Now, each of these four represent one or, in a couple of cases, a transition between a few of the platonic models of the soul. Now, if you want a little bit more depth into what these models are, what they represent, how the political al analogies work, again, there's a couple of, uh, of lectures that I have that will be linked down below in the description as well. But in short, Plato outlines the most perfect possible human soul, the properly structured human soul, which he calls the aristocrat or the aristocratic soul, all the way down through uh, various stages of, uh, of disorder, and vice, all the way down to the, the almost perfect inversion of the aristocratic soul being the tyrannical soul, or the soul of the tyrant. These have differences in their structure, but their primary, uh, their primary uh, differentiating characteristics for each of these various models of the soul that he goes through is what the soul is aimed towards, what is its ultimate end, or what does it consider as its ultimate end. And then what is it ruled by? What part of itself is its primary ruling characteristic? And each of these has a different combination of the two. For the aristocratic soul, the highest and most perfect and virtuous soul, that which it aims towards is justice. It aims for something higher than and beyond itself, not its own needs, not its own desires or wants, 
but what it ought to be aimed towards, some higher unity that it strives to be a part of and perhaps strives to lead. One step below the aristocratic soul, we have what's called the timocratic soul or the soul of the timocrat. The timocratic soul is led by the passions and it is integrated for the sake of honor. Now, honor here can be uh, can be honor in a strict military sense, which is primarily what Plato envisions, but it can also be things like reputation. And this is where we start to get a bit more of a connection to the high school girls of Mean Girls. But before I get into those analogies, I want to go through the rest of them as well, because below or the or slightly more disordered than the uh, the honor seeking timocratic soul, we have what's called the oligarchic soul or the oligarch. And this is uh, ruled by necessary desires, desires which are for uh, the preservation of the self, and it is for the sake of security. It is to keep itself safe and to avoid danger. Uh, this is uh, what, um, what we might call the, uh, the conservative soul or the most conservative soul. And it is most often associated with the accumulation and even hoarding of wealth. Because wealth represents a kind of security from unforeseen dangers. And okay, so next up, beneath uh, or further distorted uh, from uh, the oligarchic soul, we have the democratic soul or the democrat. The democratic soul is a leaf on the wind, blowing about uh, and tossed around by any unnecessary desire that may pop into one's head. And so this is the indecisive person. They are ruled by their, their unnecessary desires, by uh, seeking this thing and then that thing, depending on what strikes one's fancy, and it is ruled for the sake of novelty. And again, we can see the, the comparison to the, to the democratic state or the democratic uh, city, where each and every given citizen is, uh, is an end, sees at least sees himself as an end in himself, and the city is attempting to, uh, to promote the good of various different individuals all with disparate wants and disparate needs. The same will apply, therefore, to the mind or to the soul, where the democratic person is constantly seeking some new thing. And then finally, the most degraded form again is the tyranny, the tyrant. This form of the soul is one in which uh, it is ordered towards purely itself for its own sake. It is ordered to nothing beyond itself. It is not uh, there to acquire anything beyond uh, keeping its own power, keeping its own uh, integrity as best it can. And it is ruled by not just the unnecessary desires, but the inordinate desires. Desires which are perverse, that ought not to be, or at least ought not to be desires intrinsic and for their own sake. This is most, uh, most commonly the desire for power for its own sake, power as such. But it can be other unnatural desires as well. This is not only the sort of personality of the tyrant, the political tyrant, but it's also the personality of the addict, someone who has this, uh, this overarching goal that they ought not to have that is slowly going to rip them apart. All right, so each of these, uh, and you'll notice there are more examples of these than there are plastics, uh, and that is because of the, a, couple of, uh, a couple of our plastics move around a little bit. So first of all, and perhaps most obviously, we have Katie, the main character uh, of the film, who is at least naturally an aristocrat. She has a well-integrated soul. She is well-raised, well-bred, uh, raised by good parents, taught very well, worldly and experienced, all of these wonderful things that we would associate with a wonderful person. However, she has the fatal flaw of being naive. And hello, high school. I'll be careful. Now, Plato will, uh, will at some times throughout the Republic acknowledge that the aristocrat will sometimes be naive in this way, uh, or at least be seen as naive by people around him. This is when he, when he uh, talks about primarily in the allegory of the cave, 
the philosopher not fitting in well with the denizens of the world. And this is because their focuses are significantly different. And so Katie is, is somewhat naive throughout the beginning of the film, and that leads her uh, to gradually, uh, at least her, leads her virtue, let's say, to gradually disintegrate throughout over the course of the film until finally by the end, she recovers. And so I think that I would, it would be fair to say that Katie uh, takes this entire journey, more or less, although it isn't in perfect stages uh, from the aristocrat to the democrat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down to the tyrant, but certainly by the by the sort of uh, second act low point when the, the burn book is revealed and she betrays Regina and the, that, whole, uh, that whole ordeal, is certainly portraying the character of the tyrant. She has fallen that far. Now, if we take a step down, or perhaps two steps down, we can then see uh, the oligarch. So the oligarchic soul is represented in the film, uh, not by Regina, but by Gretchen. So Gretchen is, first and, first and most notably, wealthy. She is the daughter, she's a sort of heiress of uh, the inventor of Toaster Strudel. And so, uh, so famously, her father is rich, and her father is incredibly influential and is capable of protecting her from any kinds of, uh, of unpleasantness, whether that is, uh, you know, backbiting among, uh, among fellow high schoolers or even among, from the administration, from the principal, etc. I don't think my father, the inventor of Toaster Strudel, would be too pleased to hear about this. And so what we find is that she, first and foremost, uh, she has concerns over safety and security. This is why we hear that That's why her hair is so big, it's full of secrets. She's constantly trying to protect herself and to protect her position. And in a lot of cases, that involves tying herself very closely to whoever it is she sees as, uh, as the most powerful immediately above her. The new queen bee, as they say. And this is because that is uh, sheltering in the sh sort of shadow of the most powerful queen bee that she can find. She finds herself to be safe and secure in that context. And this is why it, uh, throughout, throughout most of the film, she attaches herself so closely to Regina. And then once Regina falls out of power, she attaches herself instead to Katie. And then at the end, to the hot Asians, right, right near the end of the film and the sort of resolution of everyone's arc. And she still finds herself in, again, the same position throughout the film, just with different people in charge of her. And this is very similar to what Plato outlines about the oligarchic person in the oligarchic city. Particularly the oligarchic city being ruled by the wealthy uh, as a representative for the necessary desires. They are very likely to become a vassal state of some more militarily powerful uh, competitor. And this is because somebody else can do the protecting for them, and they won't have to protect themselves. It is easier, it is simpler, it is more secure, and it's more reliable to instead, say, do something like pay tribute to somebody more powerful, who can then protect you, rather than having to put the, uh, put the expense forward to protect yourself, and also risk being defeated. And so there is an element of cowardice to the oligarch. We see that. Uh, in Gretchen, but we also see a readiness to betray if she thinks that it will serve her, and we certainly see this because she is more than willing to to share those secrets from time to time under the right circumstances if she thinks that it will keep her in a better social status and a better social standing. And you know she cheats on Aaron. Yes, every Thursday he thinks she's doing SAT prep, but really, she's hooking up with Shane Oman in the projection room above the auditorium. And I never told anybody that because I'm such a good friend. <laughs> the next step down, we have the democratic soul. And this is, I would argue, represented by Karen. Karen is not particularly bright. And typically, the democratic soul, nor the democratic state, uh, are particularly uh, particularly intellectual, and we see this in uh, in Karen, also represented by her being drawn to any given uh, desire that might come up. You want to do something fun? 
You want to go to Taco Bell? She is with the plastics primarily because she has no uh, no guiding force of her own. She needs something or someone else to lead her along to where she ought to be or where she uh, what will make her happy and what will make her uh, make her doing better in just sort of generally in life. I can put my whole fist in my mouth. Want to see? No, that's okay. And then we also see when she doesn't have this kind of gu particular guidance, we see that she is, of all the girls, the most prone to strange little desires. She'll want to go and do something, or she'll want to go and uh, go and talk to some boy that uh, that ordinarily one would not think of and would be a little bit odd for anybody. But she's drawn to something, and then she'll latch onto it. Whatever it is, she'll latch onto it until she gets bored with it and moves along. You know who's looking fine tonight? Seth Mosakowski. Okay, you did not just say that. What? He's a good kisser. He's your cousin. Yeah, but he's my first cousin. Right. Now again, this could just be attributed to her uh, less than stellar IQ, but I think if we look at it in this, uh, according to this model, we can find that Karen really well typifies the Democrat. Uh, again, not the political party, the democratic soul in Plato's sense, that one is constantly being buffeted around by errant desires, by wanting this or wanting that, and so able to uh, able and willing to switch between paths in life very regularly. And then finally, we have the tyrant. The tyrant is most obviously represented by Regina, but then again also uh, represented by Katie later in the film, uh, before she sort of learns her lesson. And so Katie uh, becomes the tyrant, whereas Regina is the tyrant throughout. Uh, she starts as the tyrant, and right up until near the end, she remains tyrannical in, uh, in her soul. So it's easier for us to analyze Regina before we start looking at some attributes that Katie develops. So Regina is tyrannical in the sense that she does not care for, uh, for the good of others, except insofar as those others will benefit her. Again, it is not merely selfishness, but the pursuit of power for the sake of power. She doesn't, she doesn't maintain friendships. She doesn't care for friends because of their, uh, because of their, uh, their own intrinsic good, right? She doesn't actually care for Gretchen or Karen or Katie for that matter and want them to be better off. And she doesn't even want them or maintain friendships with them because of what they can give her. Because as far as she, she's concerned, they can't give her anything. Rather, she maintains friendships with them because they adore her. She wants, first and foremost, above everything else, power over others. And having this network of plastics allows her that power in the high school context. Not just power over the other plastics, but power over the school in general power over everyone, and we have that sequence at the beginning, of course. Regina George is flawless. She has two Fendi purses and a silver Lexus. I hear her hair is insured for $10,000. I hear she does car commercials in Japan. Her favorite movie is Varsity Blues. One time she met John Stamos on a plane, and he told her she was pretty. One time she punched me in the face. It was awesome. We also see that she is uh, more than willing to to do uh, very duplicitous things to maintain her power, even if it would wind up uh, reflecting poorly on her in some ways. Think of the burn book, of course. Miss Wieners, why would Regina refer to herself as a fugly slut? She will make herself out to be the victim because that will provide her with a kind of power, especially in this, this sort of high school relational aggression context. And again, we see this uh, all too clearly with how she handles the burn book. Not only does she, <clears throat> not only does she use this as a way of trapping the other three plastics, and not only does she use this as a way of, of showing herself to be a victim, or at least portraying herself as a victim. But she also uses it to drive the rest of her ecosystem into violence and chaos. When she can no longer control everything, she needs to destabilize it so she can grab control back. This is a 
hallmark of the tyrant. The, ty the tyrant would rather destroy what he cannot possess rather than allow someone else to possess it. And this is exactly what Regina does to essentially the entire junior class of girls near the end of the film with the burn book. Mom, can, can you pick me up? I'm scared. Because she is so willing to destroy and so unwilling to let go of power, we can see her innately and very strongly tyrannical tendencies. We also see this in her, uh, in her interactions with Janice Ian. Right, so Janice and Regina used to be best friends in middle school, but when, uh, when uh, they became, to Regina's mind, a bit too, uh, a bit too codependent, right, that, uh, that Regina started having other interests and Janice still wanted to maintain the friendship, Regina didn't just cut her off, but burned her. So then eighth grade, I started going out with my first boyfriend, Kyle, who was totally gorgeous, but then he moved to Indiana. And Janice was like weirdly jealous of him. Like if I would blow her off to hang out with Kyle, she'd be like, why didn't you call me back? And I'd be like, why are you so obsessed with me? So then for my birthday party, which was an all girls pool party, I was like, Janice, I can't invite you because I think you're a lesbian. Again, with the rumor of her being a lesbian, she intended to completely eliminate this potential rival. Again, this is, a, this is a hallmark of the tyrant. They cannot bear anything or anyone that can be remotely considered an equal. To the tyrant, there's no such thing as an equal. There can only be a superior to whom one, uh, one is sort of sycophantic, trying to draw power from somebody more powerful. Or there can be an underling, someone who, uh, who is there to support one's own power base. There can be no equal. If there is an equal, that, e that is a rival. That is an enemy. And so this genuine friendship that they presumably had through middle school, this developed into, at least on Regina's part, an intense rivalry and even hatred. And then therefore it developed, uh, that, that sort of became mutual once she, once she inflicted a, uh, a terrible attack upon Janice, uh, at least terrible attack by high school girl standards. And then she dropped out of school because no one would talk to her. When she came back in the fall for high school, all of her hair was cut off and she was totally weird and now I guess she's on crack. Katie, we would also say, at least by the end of the, uh, by the end of her, um, or sort of by the low point, I should say, of her arc, also becomes the tyrant. She is far, uh, she's far too willing to lie. She's very willing to manipulate. Uh, whether that has to do with, uh, with the other plastics, or with Janice, uh, or really anybody else. But we also see that her desires become primarily for power and status. What she wants to do in her sabotage of the plastics that she started off with, uh, she started off with, with Janice, it becomes a kind of status symbol of her own. She wants to take over for Regina. It's not enough to, say, get revenge on Regina for Janice. It's not enough to expose her for, uh, for the tyrant that she is. No, by the end of it, she wants to replace Regina, and she succeeds. She wins over uh, both, uh, both uh, Gretchen and Karen. She becomes the new leader of the Plastics, the new Queen Bee, if you will, and all of her actions, both at that point and even near the end leading up to it, are primarily about obtaining and maintaining power. Even her relationships are defined in terms of uh, rivalry and, uh, and comparative power and comparative authority. She wants uh, these friendships because they are powerful. She wants the boy because he makes her powerful. Because he used to quote, belong to Regina. Okay, so... We missed one, you'll notice. We did not discuss the Timocrat, or the Timocratic soul. That being that, the one which is for the sake of honor, uh, and ruled by the passions. And there's a reason for this. I theorize that if Katie is a sort of natural aristocrat, Gretchen is a natural oligarch, and Karen is a natural democrat, I hesitate to say that Regina is a natural tyrant, primarily because the tyrant is an unnatural form of the soul. It is so degraded and so corrupt as to be almost fully disintegrated. It is almost not even a person anymore to the point where 
it's essentially living in hell. And so to say that there is a natural tendency towards tyranny, or being a tyrant, or being a, uh, having a tyrannical soul, or anything like that, would effectively be to say that, that someone can be so intrinsically disordered <clears throat> as to have no redeeming qualities or no virtues whatsoever. And that's nigh, on, that's nigh on impossible, if not impossible outright. If it is, then it's somebody who would be something like a pure sociopath. And even that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't push it that far, because yeah, I would think that, or at least I would think for, uh, according to Plato, that even a sociopath, even somebody who, who has a deeply corrupted moral sense, can still learn to act rightly and can still learn to, to capitalize on those virtues that he does possess, or she does possess, as the case might be. And so, thinking that there could be a sort of natural tyrant, one who does not fall into tyranny but is born there, seems to go contrary to Plato's, Plato's ideas. Rather, I would say that Regina is naturally a timocrat. She is naturally uh, ruled by her passions and, uh, and acts for the sake of honor. Or maybe we should say, again, keeping the, uh, the high school context in mind, rather than honor, we should call it reputation. Because that is, I think, her primary goal and what led her to this sort of position and this path of tyranny. Because her primary motivation and her primary concern, the way that she seeks power and the kind of power that she seeks <clears throat> is a relational kind of power. It is a reputational kind of power. It is the kind of power that relies upon others' perceptions of oneself. And so again, what we see, what we wind up seeing is uh, that, that Regina is very, very highly concerned with, say, losing three pounds. I want to lose three pounds. She cares a lot about how others see her. She cares a lot about her status. Now, if all of these things are still, throughout the movie, couched in terms of power, the kind of power that she seeks is, is particularly timocratic. And what's particularly interesting with, about this as well, a couple of things. First of all, that the democratic soul is the second closest to perfection. In other words, it has, it, it, it has the least wrong with it out of the various forms of, of degraded or imperfect sorts of souls. And so Regina may have started off from quite a high place. And again, as, uh, as various saints have said, the corruption of the highest becomes the lowest. It takes Lucifer, the highest of the angels, to fall and become Satan. The same would apply to a timocratic person becomes almost the worst tyrant you can find. I say almost because the fallen aristocrat, that is Katie, surpasses her even still and becomes the worst tyrant possible, at least again within this particular high school context. So <clears throat> we can see that that Regina, if she was originally a timocrat, we can see the sort of path that she may have taken towards falling into tyranny, falling into seeking power for its own sake, that comes first from seeking power for the sake of honor, for the sake of glory, for the sake of reputation. And then it becomes an end in itself. She may want these friends because they reaffirm her, and then that gradually gets twisted into not wanting them because they reaffirm her, because they like her, but because they venerate her, they honor her, because they... they well, as we see of uh, the sequence near the beginning, everyone wants to be her. It was awesome. It's kind of power that she has over everyone, but it's the sort of power that a Timocrat would desire. The other interesting bit about my idea that, that uh, Regina is most innately a Timocrat is we see at the end. Right at the end, where all of the various girls are getting their own little, uh, little wrap-up endings, Regina becomes a jock. Uh, she starts playing sports with the with the jock girls. And it's most notable that none of them are afraid of her. And so she finally, first of all, starts to acquire equals. Other girls on her team are, for all intents and purposes, both social equals and equals in power. And they aren't competitive with each other, except they are competitive with the other teams. They are competitive, but they... They themselves, among themselves, among this team of, uh, among this team, are equals. And we also should note 
that of the various uh, of the various types of souls, the timocratic soul is the most prone to uh, or the most drawn to physical activity, to exertion, to sport. So again, I think this fits exceptionally, exceptionally well. Now, there's one more note about this as well. It is about Katie's return from the tyrant to uh, the aristocrat. And this aligns with another of Plato's allegories. Uh, and this is Glaucon's test case from, from the second book that we then see sort of carried through as a, uh, as a through line throughout uh, at least books two through nine, even through ten to an extent. And this is the question of uh, reputation versus reality. Is it better to be thought, uh, thought of highly or to actually be virtuous, but to be thought of lowly? And Katie struggles with this throughout, uh, throughout the entire film, really. To begin with, from the beginning, and especially as she becomes more and more ingrained within, within the, the group of the plastics, she starts caring far more about reputation, about what people think of her, rather than actually being a good, just, and virtuous person. She starts lying far more. She starts manipulating people a lot more. She starts abandoning her friends, but coming up with excuses for it so that they, at least initially, don't notice. And then when the burn book comes out, she refuses to take the blame for it, even though she at least is partially responsible. So she refuses to take the blame for it because of the negative consequences that it would lead to for her. This winds up getting inverted later on, right near the end. She finally does the right thing. And she takes the blame for the burn book. Now, she does something interesting here. Again, very interesting from a Platon uh, platonic or a Platonist point of view. She doesn't just take the credit and explain exactly what happened. She takes all of the blame, even though the blame is realistically spread across all of the plastics and should mostly go to Regina. She doesn't point the finger at anyone else. She entirely blames herself. She takes the entire blame for the entire thing unjustly, one might say. So she receives a great deal of punishment and of scorn, especially of scorn, uh, by other students and by teachers and by people she greatly respects, even her parents, really, for something that she was only partially responsible for. Now, she was partially responsible for it. She still did, what, did, did wrong things throughout sort of the middle third of the movie. But by taking full responsibility for it, she winds up sacrificing her reputation for justice, for integrity, for virtue. How much trouble did you get in for telling the truth? A lot. Well, you didn't write that whole book yourself. Did you tell Mr. Duvall who else did it? No, because I'm trying this new thing where I don't talk about people behind their backs. Anyway, I'm sorry. I forgive you. This is what we see Plato lay out as the choice that is appropriate to the perfectly virtuous person or to the aristocrat. That if given this choice between a perfect reputation for justice while being entirely unjust, which is what Regina does, at least right up until the end, versus being perfectly just but having an incredibly uh, debased reputation, a reputation for abject injustice, that it would be absolutely preferable to be perfectly just in reality, even if no one knows it, and even if everyone thinks that you are perfectly unjust. So to do the right thing, to ease the harms done by the burn book as best she possibly can, all while taking on the negative reputation that comes along with having taken, taken the blame for the burn book. And so Katie, in her sort of, uh, in her sort of reform, leading into the ending of the film. She takes on this challenge that Plato lays out for us, that we ought, to we ought to prefer justice rather than the appearance of justice. We ought to prefer real virtue rather than the good things that might come from virtue. And we see this, again, in seeing this, we see Katie recover from the tyrant back to the aristocrat. And we see at the end that she is as perfectly happy as any high school girl can be. And she even manages to sort of restore and reframe the lives of the other plastics. 
uh, in a very positive way, in a positive sense for all, for all involved. So here we have, again, a wonderful, wonderful, probably unintentional, platonic allegory uh, in one of the strangest of places. And so, hopefully, uh, this will provide us a good example of, uh, of a philosophical analysis of the unexpected, a philosophical analysis of something that doesn't seem to be all that philosophical, uh, but is nonetheless, uh, even all of the philosophy aside, a great movie. So, that's all I've got for this time. And remember, I'm Professor McCoy, and on Wednesdays, we wear pink.